South Africa is not a safe place for, for us young women. Women are getting killed every day and no justice is being given. It wasn't a shocker because it's something that we used to in South Africa. I mean, who gets their justice? South Africa's femicide rate is five times the global average. South Africa is so corrupted because of the police, they're not doing their job. The same men are supposed to protect us are the same men are killing us. Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you very much for joining me here again today. Today we're going to talk about a case that was suggested to me, so thank you very much. But last week we spoke about that unsolved case involving a South African police officer, allegedly. But that case is still ongoing. But today we are going to talk about a case that was kind of solved on the day. But we'll get into the nitty gritty about this later. But with that being said, let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. Today we are heading to Makanda, Eastern Cape to the beautiful and stunning Rhodes University. Rhodes University is an institution that is 118 years old and has quite a high reputation for academic excellence. And today we are going to talk about a young lady named Amanda Twayi. She was 21 years old at Rhodes University at the time and some of her fellow students described her as calm, loving and always ready to laugh. Amanda had a two-year-old son who she was incredibly good to. Whenever she had some extra time besides university and studying and being a full-time student, she would spend all of her time with her son. Amanda was described by her family as loving and she would always want to spend time with family whenever she could, especially her grandmother. So let's get into what happened at Rhodes University. And we are going to tell what happened based on the account of a man named Siander. Siander Marty was part of the Cullen Bowles Res at Rhodes University. And he was also a student there and he stayed in this res. And Siander and Amanda had one class together and that's where they met. They became thick and fast friends. And obviously because they were friends, they started talking and they became very close to each other quite quickly. Siander then asked for Amanda's number and they started chatting over text. He then invited her as a friend on Facebook. They started talking on Facebook as well. And then Siander also invited her to a friend's birthday party. But Amanda declined this invitation over Facebook and they mostly then just spoke over WhatsApp or over text. But eventually, after talking for a while and obviously having a class together, they eventually decided to actually meet up and just hang out. And Amanda agreed to meet Siander at his Cullen Bowl res. And this was on the 19th of April, 2014. And they were then walking around the residence and they went up to a balcony. They started chatting and just talking to each other. They then went to a famous monument around the university where they also just talked and maybe held hands. We're not quite sure. But one thing is clear that they felt very comfortable in each other's company. So from the 20th of April to the 25th of April, Amanda would go to Siander's room every night. And she would go there from half past seven in the evening to 12 midnight or 12 in the morning. And then she would leave back to her race. Amanda did tell Siander that she had an ex-boyfriend and she said that her ex-boyfriend did not want to accept the breakup but she was so over him and she was so ready to move on. She said that he broke up with him because he was abusive and he was a control freak over their relationship and she also said that the reason that they broke up was because she felt that he was going to hurt her and that he was going to do some serious damage to her and it is unclear whether her ex-boyfriend is the father of her two-year-old son. But I do just want to reiterate before we go further into the story, remember we are telling the story from Siander's point of view and what he remembers and what he recalls from that night. But then this mysterious ex-boyfriend, his name is Nkosanati Nkabisa. And Nkosanati arrived on campus in April to find his ex-girlfriend Amanda. And on Friday the 25th of April, Nkosanati was on campus. And for some reason Siander said that Nkosanati had messaged him so I don't know what the connection is and how they got each other's numbers, how Nkosanati even knew that Siander was with Amanda, but apparently, according to Siander's court proceedings and his witness statement, was that Nkosanati messaged him the day that this incident occurred. So Siander said that on the 25th of April, he didn't see Amanda for the entire day. He only saw her later in the afternoon because she had some practical that she needed to do during the day. 
But because Siander knew that Nkosanati was in town, he told Amanda, rather don't stay with me, rather go stay with your friend, because then he won't know where you are. But Amanda refused. She really wanted to be with Siander because that's where she felt safe, and she didn't want to be anywhere near Nkosanati. Siander kept getting texts from Nkosanati the entire day, and Amanda kept getting calls from him. He would not relent in order to see Amanda. Siyanda then says that the last call that he got from Nkosanati was at 11pm on the 25th of April 2014. And just like the days before, Amanda had spent her time in Siyanda's room from around 7.30 to around midnight. However, what was different was that she actually fell asleep because they were busy watching a movie. And then around 3am on Saturday the 26th of April, a first year student named Nati, he came knocking on Siander's door to say that there's some guy who keeps saying that he wants to come in and see you. He was constantly persistent. I just came home and he pushed his way through the gates and he's adamant that he wants to see you. So Siander knew instantly that this was going to be in course Nati and he then told Amanda to hide under the bed. He then threw all of Amanda's stuff into the cupboard and he made sure that there was no sight of her. And luckily he did this just in time because up the passage comes Nati and Nkosa Nati. Siander then said to Nkosanati that you can see Amanda's not here, you need to leave this place, you can't be in this residence. Siander then walked Nkosanati out of the residence, he then manually locked the front gate and he then walked back to his room. However, Nkosanati now knew where Siander slept. But then at around 6am on the 26th of April, still the same morning, Siander then gets a loud knock at his front door or his bedroom door. And he can now hear that Nkosanati is shouting from behind the door. He wants to see Amanda. He knows that she's in there and he starts banging the door. So Siander quickly tries to stop him from breaking the door. As Siander gets to the door handle and just opens it up a little, Nkosanati then comes tumbling into the room. Amanda didn't have enough time to hide and he sees Amanda now in the same bedroom as Siander. Siander said though that Nkosanati seemed incredibly calm. He noticed now that his ex-girlfriend was standing in this room with this other guy and he was kind of processing the whole situation. But then just like a flip of a switch, he then started raging and shouting at Siander for apparently being with Amanda. Siander then managed to kind of escape out of the door. He then runs for the warden's room. The warden wasn't there at the time. He then ran for the sub warden's room and the sub warden then woke up. His wife was also in the room and they then came running towards Siander's room. But meters just before they got to Siander's room, they heard gunshots ring out. Okay, so let's just stop there for a second and just digress because that was very intense. So Amanda's ex-boyfriend, Corsonati, was now at the res at 3 a.m. in the morning. He left because apparently Amanda wasn't there. He walked into Siander's room. He didn't find any evidence of her. He then walked away, made himself scarce for three hours before he then comes back at 6 a.m. And then he finds Amanda in Siander's room. Siander then runs out. When he comes back, there are gunshots that have just rung out. So let's just point out that I don't think anyone looking for anyone at three o'clock in the morning is a good thing. I mean, let's be honest, it's either a booty call or you're looking for trouble. However, we don't exactly know what Nkosanati's intentions were at this time. It is obvious that he was looking for Amanda, but what he wanted to do or say to Amanda was unclear at the 3 a.m. slot. So if we just head back to the room, the sub warden is the first one to open the door. He then tells Siander to wait back. He must not come into this room. So Siander doesn't exactly see immediately what is in the room. The sub warden then calls an ambulance and he calls the police. When police entered the room, the sight was absolutely horrific. When police entered, they saw two bodies, one of a male and one of a female. Both were deceased at the scene and they were both taken away to be examined in the morgue to find a cause of death, even though it seemed pretty obvious to the police. So when police first arrived, they saw the lifeless body of Amanda Twayi. When police first had a look at Amanda's body, they first assumed that she had actually been strangled to death because she had quite bad marks around her neck. But then when they went over to the male's body, who was actually Nkosanati's body, they noticed that there was a single gunshot wound to the side of his head. So the police then took the bodies away. They did a whole post-mortem when they actually realized the cause of death for Amanda. Amanda's death was a bit more complicated. They did find a single gunshot wound in her chest area and she had strangulation marks to her neck. But it seemed that she may have actually passed away from a heart attack 
while she was being strangled because police found it difficult to determine an exact cause of death because it seemed that the heart attack, the strangulation and the gunshot wound all happened in pretty quick succession. And like we said, Nkosanati had passed away from a single gunshot wound to the head. But when police first went to the scene, they actually opened a murder docket because they thought that maybe someone else had murdered them. Nkosanati was 34 years old at the time of his death and Amanda was only 21. They both had long lives to live, but jealousy, blindness, and pure rage made Nkosanati take the lives of both of them. Because of the statements of the sub-warden and Siyanda at the time, the detectives found that a possible reason or motive of murder was that it was a complete love triangle and Nkosanati could not handle the feeling of seeing Amanda with another man. And this case makes me so frustrated because all of the parties involved were relatively young. Yes, Nkosanati was a bit older than Amanda and Siyanda, but they all had long lives to live. And basically, Siyanda had to listen to his girlfriend die right in front of him. And the trauma that he must still be living with, it's just heinous that Nkosanati had to do that to him. So there were basically three lives ruined on that day. Amanda is leaving behind, back then, a two-year-old son. She had her entire degree to look forward to and the rest of her life with her son and whatever she was going to bring to the world. But I think that this case is quite interesting because of the love triangle. We don't know the full story of why Nkosanati was actually there. Was he still actually Amanda's boyfriend? We are not really sure, but she does say that it was her ex. And it seems like Nkosanati just couldn't handle that Amanda was no longer in his life. And he completely raged out, he flipped out, and he murdered, apparently, the love of his life, and then turned the gun on himself. But, like I said, let me know what you think of this case down below. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend further. Please stay safe out there, and I'll see you again next week. Bye! (music) 